the sermon reading is the next two sermons of Christopher Love under the general title of The Combat Between the Flesh and the Spirit. The third sermon then was preached on November 3rd, 1650. The text is Genesis 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. Having shown that it is a grievous judgment to have the spirit withheld from the ministry of the word, and having laid down several cautions and positions concerning this judgment, I come now to answer an objection. You may say this is a very sad judgment indeed, but what demonstration may be given thereof, or how may it be known that this judgment is in any part of the world? For answer hereunto, you must know that this is a very dark point and hardly determined, and therefore many of the particulars I shall give in answer to it shall be but probable conjectures rather than infallible demonstrations. There are many things that give me to fear that in part, the saving operations of the Spirit are withheld from the ministry of the Word. First, we have cause to fear that in part the Spirit is withdrawn from the ministry of the Word among us, because there are fewer converted by the ministry of the Word now than in former times. The Spirit ceases to back the ministry of the Word with numerous numbers of converts, which is an argument that the Spirit is in part withdrawn. When the disciples first preached the gospel, how Satan fell down like lightning before the word. There were 3,000 converted in one day by Peter's sermon. We preach 3,000 sermons and do not convert one. Multitudes were brought in and converted in the morning of the gospel. According to that gospel promise, from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. That is, multitudes of people should be converted upon the first preaching of the gospel, which should overspread the earth, even as the morning dew. But in the age wherein God has cast us, the number of converts are greatly lessened, and not only lessened to what they were in former times, but to what they have been in our time. What numbers of the younger sort of people come in upon the preaching of the word within these few years? But now, the work of conversion is at a great standstill. Heretofore, ministers fished with a net, and many were brought in. But now, we fish as it were with an angle. Now one comes in, and then another. This may be one probable demonstration that, in part, the Spirit of God is withdrawn from the ministry of the Word. Two, another conjecture is this. When men live under the ministry of the word and grow worse and worse and not better for men to remain many years under the ministry of the word and yet to be more blind and more blockish, more perverse and more profane. This argues that certainly the spirit of God is withheld from such and that their destruction is nigh. The ground which has the rain falling upon it and yet is unfruitful is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned as the Apostle speaks. The Spirit being withheld, the reign of the gospel is a curse to them, and the end of such shall be burning. Three, you may fear the Spirit is withdrawn from the ministry of the word because there are more perverted by error than converted by the truth. These last years especially, erroneous men have had liberty and countenance. What multitudes have been perverted and led away by the errors of ungodly men? This is an argument of, judi of a judicial hardness upon the land. How are we fallen into those times of which the Apostle Peter speaks, wherein shall be false teachers and such who shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. How many in these days have been perverted following the pernicious ways of false teachers, which surely is an argument of the Spirit's suspension of the ministry. Fourth, the word of, the, of truth is so adulterated with error 
And this may be a reason why the word prevails so little upon the hearts of men. In a field where there are many weeds, the seed will never grow. And where there are many errors sprung up in a church, the seed of God's word will not thrive. The increase of damnable heresies suspends the working of God's spirit in the hearts of men. It is said of Christ that he taught the people with authority and not as did the scribes. And why not as did the scribes? You have the reason given by Christ in Mark. He says, you make the word of God of none effect through your traditions, which you have delivered. It was of no force upon the consciences of their followers. Their erroneous traditions made the word of God of none effect, even as those erroneous opinions in our days. How do they eclipse the glory and the splendor of the word of God and hinder the Spirit's working? Is not this the language of many? How shall we believe ministers? If we go to one congregation, we shall hear one thing preached. If we go to another, we shall hear the same thing contradicted. How this staggers people and greatly hinders the working of the Spirit upon them. The Apostle Paul, when he tells you of the force of his ministry, says we do not handle the word of God deceitfully. That is, we do not mix nor adulterate the word as vintners do their wine. But by manifestation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The word in their mouths was truly and powerfully preached. It reached even the consciences of men. Five, because men deny the calling of the ministry. This may be another reason why God suspends his spirit's operation in it. God will not pursue the ministry to such with efficacy who condemn and deny the ministry. There are multitudes of men who do not only despise our persons, but the very ministry itself, who deny the calling and would beat down the office. And therefore it is just with God that those who will not believe the office of the ministry shall not find the efficacy of the Spirit in it. Hence, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, says, Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. As if he should say, You know our office and calling and our manner of living. You believe it. And therefore, the gospel comes to you not in word, but in power and in the Holy Ghost. It is observable of John the Baptist that the reason why he wrought so much on the people, insomuch that all Judea and the regions around about came, unto, came out unto him, was because they all held John for a prophet. The people believed his office. They held that the baptism of John was of heaven and not of men. And therefore, for men to cry down the office of the ministry and to deny it may render it ineffectual and may provoke God to withhold his spirit from accompanying it. Six, another reason why God withdraws his spirit from the ministry is because multitudes run upon the office of the ministry without a call. And those who run when God sends them not, he will not bless the word in their mouths for the good of the people. And this you see clearly from the 23rd chapter of the prophet Jeremiah, where the Lord says that he sent not those prophets Yet they ran. He spoke not to them, yet they prophesied. But what good shall they do to the people to whom they prophesied? You find in the 32nd verse, Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. Such shall be the effect of their preaching, who run upon the office without a call. Seventh, and lastly, are another reason why the Spirit of God backs not the ministry of the Word as in former times. Maybe because the judgment of the sword is upon the land. It may be you think this a strange reason, but I may evidence it, th it thus. Other judgments, as sickness upon a man's body, the plague, famine, or such like, concur with the word and set the word preached home upon the hearts of the people. But the sword is a judgment which makes men savage and brutish one towards another. Whereas in other judgments, men will look at God's hand in them. Before these wars, how many converts were brought in? Since the sword came among us, how, how it has made neighbor cruel to neighbor. That amiableness and sweetness for which the English nation had a commendation. 
how it is now turned into barbarousness. Thus I have done with the first particular, wherein I have showed you this great spiritual judgment when the spirit is withdrawn from the public ministry and likewise the demonstrations and causes of such a judgment. How the spirit is withheld. I now come to the second part to show you the woefulness of that judgment when the spirit is withheld from men in his inward motions upon the conscience in their ordinary walkings. The Spirit of God may be withheld from men in his inward motions upon the conscience two ways, in regard of sin and in regard of duty. First, in regard of sin, the Spirit may be withheld two ways. <coughs> First, before the commission thereof, that he shall not check or dissuade you from it. And second, after the commission of sin, that he shall not rebuke and convince for it. I shall show you how it appears to be a misery to have the Spirit withheld from you before and after the commission of sin. Why or for what reason the Spirit of God is withheld both these ways and how far a child of God may be thus left of the Spirit. First now, to make it appear that it is a grievous judgment to have the Spirit withheld from a man before the commission of sin, it may be thus demonstrated. If the Spirit does not dissuade you, you will be ready and apt to yield to any sin you are tempted to. Men under the temptations of sin without the contrary dissuasions of God's Spirit are like a city whose walls are broken down and so are liable to every incursion of an enemy. The dissuasions of the Spirit are as, a fort, as fortresses to preserve the stronghold of man's heart. They fence and keep the heart. When the devil by temptations persuades to sin, the Spirit by his motions, graciously dissuades from it. Oh, do not break God's law. Do not wound and hurt your own conscience by these dissuasions. There is a curb laid upon the heart. But when these are away, how venturous will a man be to do evil? It is said of Paul and Timothy that they planned to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. So may it be said of many a man in respect of sin, he has, through the corruption of his heart, essayed to commit such and such a sin, but the Spirit has not suffered him. As a godly man, he cannot do all the good he would because of the flesh, so sometimes he shall not do all the evil he would because of the Spirit. When the wind blows with a fresh gale, the vessel may sail against the stream, which otherwise was to be carried down that stream. So it is with the gales of the Spirit. They help a man to overcome the stream, both of temptation and corruption, too. But when the Spirit is withdrawn, then how venturous will a man be to commit sin? If you are left by the Spirit, you will not only be apt and ready to yield unto sinful temptations, but you will suddenly and eagerly commit sin. We read of that young man being seduced by the flattering and fair speech of a harlot, who straightway followed her, when temptation is once given and the Spirit does not dissuade, how suddenly will a man be surprised? As gunpowder to a fire, so is temptation to a corrupt heart. If the dissuasions of God's Spirit do not fence and keep it. But this is not all. A man will not only be apt to fall and fall suddenly, but here is a further mischief. You will commit a sin eagerly. You will be mad upon your lust. You will burn in the sin and be poisoned with the evil. And this, the Holy Ghost hints to us, speaking of the Gentiles who were without the Spirit of God. Says he, they were past feeling. That is, they had no motions of God's Spirit. They were without the operations of the quickening Spirit. But then what follows? Says he, they have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That is, they sin and think they can never sin enough. As a covetous man who is greedy of gain thinks he can never have enough, so these think that they shall never have their fill of lusts. Observe a fivefold gradation in this sin. First, they were past feeling. Now, what follows this? It is not said they were carried away inconsiderately to sin, but they gave themselves to sin. When the Spirit is in a man and dissuades him from sin, he is never carried to it, but he goes in a hurry. He is carried with reluctance. 
but let the Spirit's motion once be withdrawn, and then he shall give himself to the devil. And two, when the Spirit is withdrawn, they not only give themselves, but they give themselves over to lasciviousness. That is, they give themselves not partially, but totally to the ways of sin. Three, it is said that they gave themselves, and this was worse than Ahab's fact, for he sold himself to work wickedness. For a man to sell himself to the devil is a great evil, but when a man shall give himself and give himself over, this is a far greater wickedness. For here was not only a giving themselves over to sin in thought, but the text says they gave themselves over to work uncleanness. They contented not themselves with contemplative wickedness, but they were workers of iniquity, such as made a trade of sin. Five, it is said that they gave themselves over to all uncleanness, not only to some sins, but to all sins, and that with greediness, which is to my purpose. Where will a man, will that man run, whom the, the evil spirit drives? If the Spirit of God does not come in with contrary motions to the devil's motions, with what a vehement eagerness will a poor man damn his own soul? Such a man will never stay till he comes to hell if the Spirit of God does not stop him in his career and say to him, This is the way, walk in it. But when the Spirit withdraws, every man turns to his course as the horse into the battle. Jeremiah 8.6 and how violently will a horse run into the battle that is not restrained with bit and bridle? Psalm 32, 9. So is the man who has neither checks of conscience nor dissuasions of the Spirit. A man being left of the Spirit of God when he is tempted unto sin will not only fall into it aptly, suddenly and eagerly, but also with complacency. And this is worst of all. So we also read of those who received not the truth and the love of it, that they took pleasure in unrighteousness. Thus I have cleared the first particular, that it is a grievous judgment to have the Spirit withheld before the commission of a sin. Second, how it appears to be so great and grievous a judgment to have the Spirit of God withheld from a man after the commission of a sin, which may be thus evidenced first, because otherwise you will Never be convinced of the evil you have done. It is the Spirit who convinces the world of sin. Without the Spirit's conviction, there is no conviction. Two, you can never repent of sin if the Spirit does not, after its commission, rebuke and convince you. For the Spirit's conviction precedes repentance. Therefore, says the prophet, no man repents, of, repents him of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? A man must be convinced that what he has done is evil before he repents of that evil. We have a proverb among us that what the eye sees not, the heart grieves not for. So if the eye of the soul sees not sin, the heart will never be troubled for sin. Three, you can never have your nature sanctified from the filth of sin unless the Spirit work on you after you're falling into sin. Sanctification is by the Spirit of God, and therefore the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians, speaking of wicked and unregenerate men, says, Such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So believers are said to be a habitation of God through the Spirit, whence you may observe the different works of the Trinity in the heart of the believer. God the Father chooses this house. God the Son buys it. And God the Holy Ghost cleanses and furnishes this house. Else it would be a nasty and dark dungeon. You can never have your spirit to be a house for God to dwell in unless the Spirit of God sweeps you with the broom of sanctifying grace. For you can never subdue the power of sin without the Spirit. Therefore says the Apostle, if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. It is by the Spirit that we mortify sin. And thus you see what a misery it is to want the Spirit in his dissuasions and convictions, both before and after the commission of sin. The question, but why does God withhold his Spirit so that he shall not dissuade men from sin when they are tempted to it? 
nor convince them for sin after they have committed it? Answer, in general, God does, does it not as an act of sovereignty, but as an act of justice. You wrong the spirit, and therefore God withholds the spirit. There are five reasons laid down as the ground why God withholds his spirit in his striving with men. First, because in times past you have refused to, to hearken to the frequent motions and persuasions of God's spirit. The spirit of God has told you that if you walk in such wicked ways, the end of them will be death. How often has he suggested unto you that if you go on in such and such courses, you'll be undone forever. And yet you have gone on in sin and would not hearken unto the Spirit. Thus God complains of his people by the psalmist. My people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them up to their own heart's lusts, and they walked in their own counsels. It is as if he should say, they would not hearken unto me, and therefore my spirit shall dissuade them no more. I will leave them to themselves, and let them take their own course. Two, because it may be you have fastened and fathered sinful affections that arise from the flesh upon the spirit's motions, and thus, and this is such an injury to the spirit that he will not bear it. For example, when men shall say their wrath, kindled from hell, is the zeal of the Spirit coming down from heaven? That their erroneous opinions are the Spirit's teachings when he is the Spirit of truth? And satanical delusions, divine inspirations? This is an indignity, not inferior than if some subject should lay his bastard child at his prince's gate. And this, some think, is understood by the vexing of the Spirit mentioned by the prophet Isaiah. This may be another cause why the Lord may withhold his spirit. Three, because men are more easily men more easily listen to the suggestions of the evil spirit than to the motions of the good spirit. It makes your friend decline to come to your house when you give entertainment to his enemy. When the devil shall come and easily prevail with you, when you shall either sin upon no temptation or upon a small temptation, this is a high provocation to God's spirit. And this is a reason why there is so severe a judgment annexed to the third commandment that God will not hold them guiltless to take his name in vain. Because there is less temptation to the sin of swearing than to any other sin in the world. Other sins are more consonant to flesh and blood. But swearing, of all sins, men have the least temptation to. The swearer serves the devil gratis and has neither profit nor pleasure by his sin. And therefore God annexes so severe punishment. When you run in, uh, unto sin upon an easy temptation, and will not hearken to God's spirit upon an earnest motion, this provokes the Lord to withhold the strivings of his spirit from you. For because in former times you have plotted and deliberated how to commit sin, therefore the spirit will withdraw from you for a time to come. There are many who commit sin with deliberation, uh, premeditation, and consultation. And that man who commits a sin deliberately and contrivedly greatly provokes the Spirit of God. It is said that a wicked man shuts his eyes to devise mischief. Shutting the eye is a studying, plotting, and deliberating posture. If you give a friend a blow accidentally... And though he may be angry at first, yet uh, when he understands that it was against your will, he will be quickly pacified. But if he sees that you plot and contrive his death, he will never come into your company again. Thus it is with the Spirit of God. When he sees you fall into sin inconsiderately and unadvisedly, he will not withdraw from you for this. But when the Spirit sees that we waylay him and deliberate and contrive how to commit sin, this provokes him, if not forever, yet for a long departure. Such deliberate acts of the soul are more directly against God, and to this purpose it is observable what you read concerning David, that he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord all his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now why does not the text say rather that he was perfect 
or did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord save only in the matter of Bathsheba? For that was the foulest sin. There is this reason given why the Spirit of God should say that he was a perfect man, save only in the matter of Uriah, rather than that in that of Bathsheba. Because his sin in the matter of Bathsheba was done rashly and inconsiderately, he was suddenly surprised with a temptation. But the matter of Uriah was, more, was done more deliberately, ploddingly, and contrivedly. First he sent for him home from the wars that he might cloak his foul act. Then he made him drunk, and after he made him carry the contrivance of his own death in a letter to Joab. It was a sin so deliberately acted that the Spirit of God put a brand upon him for it. Take heed, therefore, of deliberate acts of sin. I censure none. Every one of you must stand or fall to your own master. But I say that it is a sin which gives a special provocation to the Spirit of God. It is the saying of a modern divine and a true one that a deliberate will to sin without the act is more sinful than the act of sin without a deliberate will. And thus it is in the case of Peter. That man does worse who's, who purposes to deny Christ, though he never does it, than Peter, who actually denied Christ and never intended it. Therefore, look to your purposes and deliberations. If you sin deliberately, it is the next step to the sin of those against whom the prophet prays, Lord, be not merciful to those that sin maliciously. Five, the Spirit of God will withdraw from a man when men prostitute the Holy Spirit to base lusts, as all hypocrites do, who, who do talk of the Spirit only to commit sin and, and enjoy their lusts more securely. Thus, Simon Magus desired the extraordinary gifts of the Spirit that he might seem somebody and enrich himself. This is but, as the Apostle speaks, 1 Thessalonians 2, 5, a cloak for his covetousness. Many grieve and provoke the Spirit to depart when they themselves do not serve God, but rather serve themselves on God. <coughs> Sermon 4, preached on November 10th, 1650. The text again is Genesis 6, 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be in hundred and twenty years. I proceed to answer another query or useful case of conscience. Question 1. How far may the Spirit of God be withheld or withdrawn even from a godly man, both before and after the commission of sins? Answer, first, I shall show you how far the Spirit of God may be withheld before, and then second, after the commission of sin. The Spirit of God, in a five-fold respect, may be said to be withdrawn from a godly man before the commission of sin. First, he shall not enlighten you to make you know it is a sin you are tempted to. And thus we read of the patriarchs who married diverse wives, the Spirit of God in that dark age of the world, known as the patriarchs, was so withheld that he did not enlighten them. Not till their dying day do we read that a polygamy was a sin, and therefore they lived in it. Second, though you may be enlightened to know that it is a sin you are tempted to, yet you may be so left of the Spirit that through the impetuousness of your lust and the violence of the temptation, you may be carried to commit that sin. And this we find plain in the case of David. David could not but know that adultery was sin. And yet, being left of the Spirit of God, the strength of his lust and the violence of his temptation was such that he was carried to commit it. Third, a godly man may be so far left by the Spirit that when he is tempted to a sin, he may rather consult with flesh and blood than with the Spirit of God as to whether he should commit the sin or not. And thus a godly man, when life, liberty, and estate lie at stake, often consults his own safety rather than inward peace. And this is very common, and yet thus it was with David in the matter of Uriah. 
For godly men may be so left that they may contrive and deliberate how to commit a sin before they commit it. Divines usually give it as a difference between godly and wicked men that the one sins deliberately and the other not. Yet there are instances in Scripture that show that godly men may contrive and deliberate how to commit a sin. Now this, as divines show, is at the threshold of hell. There is but a little between them and damnation. With David, it is true, the sin of adultery was not as deliberate as the murder of Uriah. For there, David contrived the means whereby he should be killed, the time when, the manner how, and the instrument by whom. Now this was a very deliberate act of sin, yet thus far may a godly man be left. Therefore, what cause have they to bless and magnify the free grace of God who has come so near hell, who have come so near hell and yet never go there? You may have your garments smell of hellfire, yet you may never come into burning. Deliberate acts of sin tend unto that unpardonable sin against the Holy Ghost, which is of malice. Therefore, take heed of such sins. Five, the Spirit of God may so leave you, though you are a godly man, that you may fall into those sins that are contrary to those graces wherein you are most eminent. For a man who is chaste to keep from those sins which are not so contrary to his native disposition is not so much. But for a chaste man to be, le to be so left of God as to fall into adultery, and for a meek man to fall into passion, is a great evil. I shall lay down several instances of godly men who have been thus left by the Spirit of God. Abraham, you find in Scripture to be the father of the faithful. What a large encomium does the apostle make of Abraham's faith. And God so left him that he fell into unbelief and distrust of God by denying his own wife, which was most contrary to that grace wherein he was so eminent. You find also that Noah is commended for being a very sober man. When all the world was eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, it was a very drunken, excessive, luxurious age, yet Noah was commended by God for his sobriety. But though drunkenness was the sin most contrary to that excellent grace of sobriety he was so eminent in, yet was he overtaken therewith. Likewise, Lot is commended by the Holy Ghost for disliking the filthy conversation of the Sodomites. And it is strange that Lot himself should be overtaken with the sin of uncleanness, should fall into the abominable sin of incest. For so you find it related of him, he lay with his two daughters. The scripture tells you that Moses was the meekest man upon the earth. Now, of all sins, you would at, you would least suspect that he should fall into passion. But yet you find Moses' meekness turned into passion, and so much that he spake unadvisedly with his lips, and thus speaks unto God, If thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. The book of Psalms tells you how eminent David was for patience, how quietly he bore God's afflicting hand, how patient was he when Shimei so cursed and reviled him. And yet, meeting with but a churlish carriage from Nabal, his spirit was all in a rage, insomuch that he went with a purposed revenge to kill Nabal and all his family. Job was most eminently an exemplary patient. Would you think that ever he should fall into impatience? Why, yes, he fell into that sin which was most contrary to that grace wherein he was most eminent. How he curses the day of his birth. Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, There is a man-child conceived. And so he prayed earnestly for the day of his death. Oh, that I might have my request, and that God would grant the thing that I long for, even that it would please God to destroy me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. Here you see the impatience of Job's spirit. This I mention to you to let you see what a poor thing man is if God's spirit leaves him. He shall not only fall into those sins which are pleasing unto nature, but into those sins which are most contrary to his nature. 
Thus you see how far the Spirit may leave a man before the commission of sin. Question two, how far may the Spirit of God leave a man after the commission of sin? One, the Spirit may not convince you that it is a sin you have done after you have committed it. And thus was, the, was with the patriarchs in the first age of the world. They were given to marry many wives, and it was so, not, no doubt, because it crossed the first institution of marriage, which was between one man and one woman. Now the Spirit of God was so withheld from them that after they fell into that sin, they were not convinced of it, and therefore they lived and died in it. Two, the Spirit may be so far from convincing a man of sin and may so withdraw from a man that after he has sinned, he may go about to defend and justify the sin he has committed. And thus Jonah sinned in not obeying God's commandment to go to Nineveh. Then when God spared Nineveh, Jonah was very angry. And when God came to reason with him, asking him whether he did well to be angry, Why, yes, says he, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Here was a good man in a pettish mood and to God's face would justify his own passion. So Israel, under the name of Ephraim, would justify their own wickedness. Ephraim is a merchant, said the prophet. The balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. But what did Ephraim say? Yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance. In all my labors they shall find no iniquity in me that were sin. And yet God charged them with the balances of deceit. Three, a godly man may for a long time, yea, many years, lie under sin. And the Spirit of God may not work remorse of conscience in him for the sin he has committed. This is very sad. Thus the Spirit was withdrawn from David. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and till a child was born. And Nathan the prophet came to him. We never read that he was troubled for his sin. The Spirit did not work remorse of conscience in him, which must be nine months after the manner of women. Nay, we read that Joseph's brethren cast him into a pit and sold him unto the Ishmaelites, and though they dealt thus unnaturally with their brother, yet the Scripture tells us that it was about 21 years before they were troubled for this sin. When they were in prison in Egypt, and then they said to one another, Verily, we are guilty of our brother's blood, and therefore this evil is come upon us. For the Spirit of God may so far withdraw from a godly man after he has committed sin, that he may commit more sins to hide that one sin rather than repent of it. This is a high step, and how near hell it is. Yet thus David, after he had fallen into adultery, does not put his conscience on work to repent of this sin, but puts his wits on work how to cover this sin. And for that end, sent Uriah home to lie with his wife, to cover his own sinful act. He made him drunk, and when he could not bring that to pass, he contrived his death and made him the messenger of death to himself. Peter was a good man, yet Peter committed many sins to excuse one sin. Nay, he committed many sins sooner than he repented of one sin, denying Christ. First he denied him, then he denied him with an oath, then he denied him with a curse. Whether he cursed Christ or himself or both, it is not certain. Thus he committed many sins to excuse one. This is a far degree, and yet thus far may a godly man go. Five, a godly man, after he has committed sin, may be so far from having power to mortify that sin that he may fall into it often and again. We have many scripture instances here of Abraham fell twice into the sin of lying and denying his own wife. Joseph fell twice into the sin of swearing. Solomon sinned against the Lord after he had twice appeared to him. The children of Israel fell into the sin of murmuring against God ten times together, one after another. Jehoshaphat sinned in sinful compliance with wicked men twice, as may be gathered. I do not mention this to bolster any man in a venturous way of sinning, but only for the ease of afflicted consciences. The Spirit may leave you thus far both before and after the commission of sin. The uses. 
Before I come to handle the withholdings of the Spirit in reference to that which is good, I shall give you the, the use of the former points. If the Spirit of God leaves you thus far, then I infer use one that you are not to impute it to God as an act of sovereignty, but as an act of justice. God is provoked to do it. Why does the Spirit of God say to you, as the Lord to Ephraim, he is given to idols, let him alone? Why is it that God's Spirit leaves you? Some affront or other you have done to the Spirit that has quenched the Spirit's motions, grieved the Spirit, vexed the Spirit, or resisted the Spirit in his operations. And therefore you shall hear no more of the dissuasions of the Spirit in the heart. Two, do not censure a man when you see him fall into sin. Do not be severe against him. If God's Spirit should be withdrawn from you, you would sin a thousand times more than that man. The Scripture commands that you restore fallen, men fallen with a spirit of meekness, considering yourselves lest you also be tempted. Do you see another man's sin? Do not judge him. Consider yourself. If the, if the devil should tempt you to a worse sin and the Spirit withdraw from you, you would sin worse than that man has sinned. Three, what cause have you to bless God that he has given the strivings of the Spirit both to yourselves and other men? Bless God that the Spirit has given to you. The Spirit in the Word is the voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And by this means you are fenced from many temptations and freed from many evils. Should a tempting devil and your corrupt heart meet and God's Spirit withdraw, into what evil would you run? A man in such a case would rush on in evil as the horse rushes on into the battle if the Spirit did not restrain him from sin. Bless God for other men. By the common restraining power of the Spirit, he lays a check and control upon the spirits of men. Were it not for this, there would be no living in the world. How would human societies be destroyed? Every man would be savage and cruel to each other. We would kill and murder every man who angered us, deceive every man who dealt with us, and tell a lie to every man who speaks to us. We would commit all sin. There is a great wickedness done in this last and worst age of the world, but there would be more evil done that did not the Spirit, like curbs and restraints upon men's consciences. For labor and pray, lest the Spirit the less the Spirit of God has striven with you before the commission of sin, that he may the more strive with you by convincing you after you have fallen into it. It may be you have sinned ignorantly, aptly, eagerly, or deliberately. The more the Spirit has been withheld from you before the commission of sin, pray to have him strive the more with you afterwards. And that in these three ways. One, by working in you a more clear conviction of sin to show you not sin in the lump, but your particular sin, clothed with all its heinous and aggravating circumstances, to convince you savingly that there may be, as it were, some compensation made of the spirits being before withheld from you. Two, in a more deep humiliation, the more the spirit has been withheld from you before the commission of sin, desire that the spirit may cast you down after its commission more. This was typed out under the law. That man who but touched an unclean thing was to be unclean till evening. But if a man had carried an unclean thing about him, then he was to cast off all his clothes. So if you have but touched a sin, you are to be humbled. But if you have fallen into a sin which the Spirit has not convinced you of, then you are to labor for a greater measure of conviction and humiliation afterwards. Three, learn that the Spirit may work in you a more dear, a dear affection to Jesus Christ. It is observed that the Spirit did more leave Peter to fall into sin than he did all the other apostles except Judas. Now when Christ came to ask Peter whether he loved him or not, he said, Simon Peter, dost thou love me more than these? He did not say only, dost thou love me, Peter, but lovest thou me more than these? As if he should say, Peter... You have sinned against me more than all the other apostles, and therefore you should love more than they. 
Mary Magdalene was a great sinner, having seven devils cast out of her. But what is said of her? Her sins, which are many, are forgiven her, are forgiven her for she loved much. That is, the less love she had to Jesus Christ before the commission of sin, the more she had afterwards. Many sins were forgiven her, and therefore she loved much. Therefore, that place must not be understood as if her love was a cause of her being forgiven, but a demonstration and an evidence of it.